Hallelujah. Hallelujah, church. Amen. Amen. A very good morning to you at home. Welcome to Oasis Church, Johannesburg. We are so glad to have you fellowship with us this morning. Please feel free to uh, take off your shoes because maybe you're home. Uh, get your gown on. Feel comfortable. Live your life. Be free in the presence of the Lord. And um, let's praise and worship together and have a good time this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. All right. You can also just maybe clap your hands a little bit like this.
Praise the Lord. Amen. I'd like to greet Abazala in the wonderful name of Jesus. Um, today, we're going to have Holy Communion. And I have two verses that I'd like to share with everyone before we partake. Um, one of the things that Jesus says to his disciples is that they should have Holy Communion as a way to remember him. And, um, and today, I want us to remember some of the things that Jesus said to his disciples while he was still on earth as we partake in the, in the, in the Holy Communion. Amen. Amen. So, um, so one of the things that Jesus said to his disciples was, was um, found in John chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that, he, he, it is he that bears much fruit. Yeah. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. So from this scripture, we, we, are, we are reminded that um, we are created for fellowship with Jesus. We are created to be in union with Jesus. We are created to be in constant relationship with Jesus. Um, the second uh, verse that I would like for us to, to read is in Romans 11, verses 16 to 18. This is where Paul is speaking about, um, about how we, uh, as people who are not initially Jews, have been introduced into this new life of faith where we can now bear the benefits of being in this household that we, know we didn't actually initially belong to. So he says, if the door of, so this is Romans 11 verses 16 to 18. He says, if the door offered as first fruit is holy, so is a whole lamb. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some, but if some of the branches were broken off, that you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in, in among the others, and now share in the nourished roots of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the roots, but the roots that support you. So we are now given a picture that we, who are not initially Jews, who are like wild olive trees that were growing and not according to the nature uh, of God. So we find that if you are a wild olive shoot, it basically means that the ways of God are foreign to you. And that um, it is not you are not capable of obeying God. You're not capable of doing the will of God on your own. But then Jesus tells us that um, we that He is the true vine, and He is a vine that we have been grafted into. Which means that even though we, we did not belong to Jesus initially, and even though it was not in our nature to be of God and to do the things of God, we now belong to God because we have been grafted into the into the branch into the into the tree which is Jesus. And 
and this basically speaks about how we are being adapted even though we're not initially part of this family and even though we were lost in our sinful natures we have now been uh, brought together into the nature of God where we can take part of a spiritual life where we are where we are alive in Christ and when we the, this this notion of a branch um, basically speaks about the fact that a tree is made up of leaves and branches and roots and together all these things make up what is a tree and this basically shows us that Jesus sees us as an extension of himself because it can't be a tree without the branches and it can't be a tree without the roots so in the same way that God sees um, the Bible tells us that Jesus and God are one and Jesus also says that we are one with him if we believe and in the same way, we are part of this big tree. We are part of this big demonstration of what God is doing. We are part of, uh, we are an extension of how fruitful God can be if we stay in him. And therefore, as we partake in, in, in communion today, I want us to make a choice to abide in the tree, which is Christ. I want us to make a choice to abide in the vine, which is Christ. And know that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. Amen. Amen. Um, so we take the bread um, so I want us to take the bread the bread today as a symbol of the of the body of Jesus that we now belong in because the, the Bible tells us that we are the body of Christ um, so this 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 to, these, these elements today are a symbol of belonging they are symbol the symbol of abiding in God and that we are one with the God that um, that lives in us so we can please uh, partake. I want us to partake in the the blood as well, as as a symbol of the of 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 Jesus and the victory that we have in Him, and the fact that we His blood runs through our veins. And his life declares victory for us. His blood declares um, freedom for us. His blood declares healing for us. Um, knowing that we are one, we are the same body, we are the same blood, we are the same bloodline as Jesus. And therefore, every victory that he's had, we can claim as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. We give you honor and praise today, O oh Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you. We thank you, Lord God, for keeping us together. The Bible says that you preserve our souls. Thank you for keeping us, O oh God. Thank you for being our glory and our covering, for being the lifter of our heads. Today, Lord God, we recognize your authority over our lives. We recognize your sovereignty. And we thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I greet you, uh, saints, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, where you are at home. Um, and I greet you all here as we are recording. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I hope you are all good and you are ready for the word of God this morning. Amen. Fundisi, I greet you as well. Amen. 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 Can we please turn our Bibles to the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 13? This will be our key scripture. I just want to read it. And I also read from Luke chapter 14, from verse 25. So this is Numbers, um, the first and the second um, verse. And then Luke 14 from verse 25. I'd like to just send a shout out to all the stewards that are serving, all the guys that are helping us in putting together these services, including the tech guys as well. Thank you so much. Uh, the worship team as well. We see you and we thank God for you. Amen. 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 Spies sent to Canaan. This is Numbers 13 verse 1 to 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to you, the children of Israel. 
from each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Amen. Amen. And then Luke 25, the cost of being a disciple. Verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, shall a person, such a person cannot be a, my disciple. I'll say that again. Such a person cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not, and are not, and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. <laughs> or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those who do not give up everything, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Pray, Lord God, that you speak your word through me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, uh, so personally, I'm someone who likes to watch uh, Marvel movies, and um, I'm bigger on Marvel than, uh, what's that other one called, <laughs> than DC. But again, yeah, I mean, we still like uh, Superman. But one of the things I've noticed with uh, those kind of movies and many other um, sci-fi movies and even your I mean it comes even to your cartoons your animation you find that whenever there's uh, there are aliens involved I don't know if you've noticed this but whenever there are aliens involved the alien nation is always depicted as greater than the, the, the army or the military of the earth if you know the, the way it's like the aliens are better with with the IT, with their technology, it, they are always a threat. And you never wonder, Wuti, the way they, they depict us compared to the alien nation is we are better. It's always they are better than us. So that has always been my fascination, Wuti. Why is it always that the alien nation is better than um, the nation or the army that comes from Earth? And, and, and I mean, also another weird thing is that the UFOs are always attacking America, which is a weird thing. We never hear, hear South Africans saying they've seen a UFO, <laughs> but you are not there. Uh, <laughs> so today I want us to talk about the follower's perspective, the view of the person who is following Christ, mm -hmm. the, 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 the way that they view life. And I want us to look at what is de uh, per perception defined as, according to the dictionary. It is defined as the way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. Mm -hmm. To perceive is to interpret or regard someone or something in a particular way. Okay. Hallelujah. Amen. So already... Uh, Based on the, I'm, I'm going to uh, look at both numbers and then we're going to go to, to look 14. But here, I want us to first establish and even lay a foundation that there's a certain view that we have or there's a certain perspective that as a follower or I'd say as a disciple, as a believer, there is a certain view of life or even a view of God that Christ is expecting. So some of us, we can easily say that for you to be, yes, to be a child of God, you have to believe, right? That is the number one. Untabeleng, when she was talk, uh, sharing on the communion, which she did very well, uh, looking at John 15, 
showing that we are an extension of Christ, but we can't be part of Christ if we don't believe. And in our belief and in our faith, it qualifies us to be part of the family of God. But there's now an expectation, Yoguti, you, as you continue in the kingdom of God, have to have a certain way of viewing God. Yeah. So I want us to quickly uh, look at uh, Numbers 14. I read from the first verses, the first one and the second one, and I want us to just touch on it again. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, so if you listen to this already, this is verse one only. Verse one says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, that's all that the verse is saying. I mean, I, I, was, I was saying to Mfundis yesterday that one could preach a lot. It seems so simple, but actually one could preach a lot on these two verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, and I am, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man everyone a leader among them. Hallelujah. Amen. So what this, what this is saying that God is the one who initiates this conversation. Verse 1 is saying that God calls Moses and says that Moses, come through. I want to tell you something. I want you to pick in each tribe a leader. So there's a leader already established in a tribe. And I want you to go, if this, the, here they were in the, they were in the desert of, of Paran, and they were halfway through moving from Egypt toward uh, the, the, the promised land. They had been given the land by God. Amen. And, and, and I, I want you to follow me. Amen. These people had already been given the land. They have not seen the land. They have not walked in the land. They, ha they don't know what to, to expect. But God had given them a word that I have given them the land. He's saying, Gengogu, the, 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 the people, the children of Israel, they come in, uh, in families, if I can put it, under the, the sons of, of Jacob, who he then called Israel. They are coming as the tribes of Israel. They are 12 tribes. And he's saying, out of each tribe, pick a leader. Take a leader. So these guys, these 12 guys are going to explore the land. So these guys are on a military assignment. They're going to check out what, if you read the whole, of, the whole chapter of 13, they're going to check out the land. They're going to check what, what is the land able to produce. They're going to check if the land is strong, the people of the land, are they strong or are they weak? What, what, is, what, are the, what, are the, what is the wealth of the land? What are the advantages of the land? What are the strategies that they are using, right? So already they are going there, sending their best men to explore the land. But they are going to a land that already the sovereign Lord, the one who already has taken them out of Israel, has promised to have given them. They are going there with the word. Over and above that, it is God who is initiating this task. It is God who is saying, Abatibona, before we go in there, let's just check out the land. God is saying, I want you, Moses, to do this task. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So the problem that we, we, we start seeing, and we're going to go through it, uh, is that these guys find they come together and they are sent to, to spy out the land. They go for 40 days to spy out the land. Now, 40 uh, biblically represents... Uh, it's a number of testing. It's a number of trying something and proving it. Jesus was in the desert for, for, for 40 days fasting. He was, he was tested in the land. We find that even the children of Israel, they were in, 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 the, in, the, in the wilderness for 40 years. Their faith was being tested during that time. Hallelujah. Amen. These guys, they go out, they spy in the land for 40, for 40 days, and then they come back. And it's time to report on what they've seen. And then they come back, they do say, you know, everything that God has said about what we are going into, the land is flowing with milk and honey. It is rich. It is there. They saw it. They even came back uh, carrying, you know, the, 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 the produce of the grapes that they harvested. It, they were big, you know. So 
th there was confirmation that what God had said the land has and is, they saw and received. And then the problem arises when, when they were seeing the people, the sons, the, the Bible talks about that, the descendants of Anak, the, the giant men. They saw the giant men, they, they became intimidated by them. When they were intimidated by them, the Bible says that they then began to start changing their language. They said that in our own eyes, against these men, they seemed very strong. We were like grasshoppers. Okay. So there's one guy, out of the two, there was Joshua. He was out of the tribe, I think he's out of the tribe of Ephraim. There was also U U U Caleb as well. They had also, they were part of the 12, uh, of the 12 guys. So Joshua and Caleb, out of the 12, had a different language. Out of the 12 tribes, two of them said, but guys, God has said, we can do this. We can actually fight against these guys. And they began to be irritated by the perception that Joshua and Caleb had. Aren't you afraid, right, of what you've seen? Because Tina, we were in our own eyes like grasshoppers. But now if you want to go back, the assignment was not to determine who you are when you go into the land. Okay. They were not sent to go first establish, Wuti, what does God say about you? Uh, God sent them to go explore what the land has so that they can, they can collect enough intelligence, collect enough wisdom, to prepare themselves for whatever is there. But God did not say who you are, what I've called you for is in question. He never asked them their opinion of who they are against them. God did not call them to go compare themselves to the sons of Anak. And the problem arose when, when these people started to tap into an area that was not even in question about the way they view themselves, even to the point of questioning what God has said. If you look in the following chapter, chapter 14, the people start to rebel. They start to rebel even to the point where amongst themselves they say, we need to then find ourselves another leader who is going to help us go back to Egypt. I wanna say to you today that the lack of faith will inevitably cause rebellion. The lack of faith will cause people to stand against God. Not only is when we lack in faith, it, 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 is, it is a negative effect in our lives, but also it causes us to come against what God has said and to come against who he is. These people offended God because they made him out to be a God who seems to be lying, a God who seemed to not be true to his word, forgetting that this task was initiated by God himself. It was God who had sent them to go spy out the land. Another point I want you to note today is that there is nothing more dangerous than when it is the leaders who are moving in the lack of faith. Because... God had sent those who seemed to be the cream of the crop to go spy out the land. It was therefore inevitable that when the leaders are lacking in faith, the people will be rebellious. When the people, when the leaders who went to spy out the land came back with report, they sowed fear into the hearts of the people that they led. They sowed fear and disruption in the heart of the people that they were leading. As a result, soon after, it was the people, not the people who did not even see the land of Canaan, were the very people saying that they want to go back to Egypt. And how terrible can it be that you are scared of what you have not seen, wanting to go back to slavery, wanting to go back to oppression because of the fear of the unknown. They were afraid of what they did not know. But the evidence that they brought showed that God is true. 
They brought back the fruit of the land. And I want to ask you this morning, how many times do you step back from the things God is calling you because you are afraid? Afraid of the unknown. You're afraid of what it takes to achieve something. Just because you've never seen it done in your family, just because you have no proof of someone entering the land, you have then said, I can't do it. But you are not aware that by standing against the thing God is calling you, calling you for, you are standing to offend God. Because he's the one who began a good work in you. He's the one who began a good work in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Who said, I'm asking you, who said you are a grasshopper? The language of a grasshopper, who gave you that language? So, it, uh, specifically to this point, the powerful thing about perception, and I want you to, to, to reflect on this and even do some introspection, because you can find that there are two people raised in the same family. They grew up experiencing the same encounters, but they have different perspectives of their experiences. You find that for someone, they grew up poor. These people can grow up poor in the same family. For someone, the poverty was able to shape them, to say that I will not allow poverty to continue in my family life. Yeah. For someone else, it can break them to think that I am a useless person. Already scientists say that the people, people who are more optimistic in life, they somehow seem to be luckier. Okay. Yeah. They, well, they call it luck, but they don't know. Even the Bible in Proverbs 23 verse 7, it says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So is he. So is he. So in the scripture, we then realize that God was extremely offended by them. They were offended by the way they were talking, the way they were influencing each other. And I want to say to you, you need to watch, you need to watch what you eat. Watch what you are feeding on. That what you eat is not actually setting you up to be, off to be offensive to God. What you are feeding yourself is not setting you up to, to lack in faith. Because faith, faith, the Bible describes faith as a seed. Meaning that it is meant to be developed. Okay. It is meant to grow. Yes. And therefore, it, it receives life. Yeah. Faith it feeds on, on uh, the seed feeds on water. It feeds on the soil, the nourishment of the soil. Meaning that to your faith, you need to add. You add the word. You speak to yourself when you don't feel like it. You speak life to yourself when, you, when you're seeing that actually this, is, this feeling I'm having is against what God has said. We can trust that God's word will not change. So the, the other things that are players here, they need to change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray right now that you will have... Uh, you, you will be surrounded by people who speak life. You will be surrounded by leaders who, who, who have the vision of God. You will be, even in your workplace, even if it's someone who does not believe in God, may they be people who are influenced by the word of God. May they be people who are influenced by the fear of God. So that wherever you are, you are able to speak life. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we see that uh, Jesus... Uh, in, in, in Luke 14, he goes on, he's speaking to, 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 to this crowd. So already you know that Jesus is followed by a crowd. I mean, that on its own is a red flag, yeah. being followed by a crowd. Because at the end, Jesus had a long-term view of things. He had a long-term view of things. Are these people the people I'm going to leave? and go back to the Father and leave them to, to spread the gospel. He knew that the people who were following him were not genuinely following him. They were following what they can get out of him. They were following the miracles. They were following the prophetic words. They were following the food they can get. And Jesus then says something so powerfully. He says, 
The one who wants to be my disciple must forsake his father and mother, his brother and sister, even his own life. There's nothing that we value like the people we are born with. There's nothing that we value in life like the people we are connected to by blood. There's nothing that we value more than our own selves. And Jesus is speaking to that directly. Are you able to sacrifice yourself? Are you able to sacrifice the most valuable thing to follow me? The standard has been set already. As an ati, the one who wants to follow me must take up his cross and follow me. Now the cross represents a, 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 an altar of sacrifice. It is the place where Jesus laid his life down. It is the place where we received our redemption. Amen. The cross represents a place where you die and Christ lives in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He says that, that if you want to be my disciple, you'd better get ready to die like Jesus died. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And it is at those points that some people began to leave him. It is at those points where it, it, it was... The, the separation between those who are really following from who, for, for who he is and those who are following him for what they could get. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to say to you this morning, in Colossians 1, it teaches us that Christ is the image of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Christ is the perfect expression of God's intent. Yeah. Christ yeah. is the perfect picture of what God expects out of us. Not only is that, the cross represents the love of God. It is God's expression of his love for us. Where when you don't deserve, he still loves you. Yeah. Meaning that out of this, God expects relationship more than you approaching him for what you can get out of him. He's expecting you to, to, when you lay down your life, you're laying it for someone that you love. Because he's loved you first. In Numbers 14, Moses speaks to God because his anger had been stirred up. And he speaks to him and he says that, Lord God, the nations have watched how you rescued these Israelites out of Egypt. And if you destroy them now, they will say that you took them out only to destroy them in the desert. And it was because of God's faithfulness that he saved them. But he said that he will, not, he will forgive them, but not without punishment because he's a just God. Theologians may correct me, but there's no way in the Bible where I've seen God described as being a nice God. But he's described as a good God. And there's a difference between being nice and good. Being nice is someone who's gonna tell you what you need to hear. Someone is, who's nice may, may be even afraid to tell you the truth because they don't want you not to like them. But God is a good God. He will not let the unjust do as they please. He will not keep quiet as we continue to defile his name. He's God who is just, but he's also true to his nature that he continued to take them to the land of promise. But he says this, for every day they had spent in the land of Canaan scouting the land, even though they came back with a report saying that they're like grasshoppers, for each of those days, for 40 of those days, they will spend 40 years in the desert. He even says that none of them, as according to what they declared with their mouths, they won't enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua's descendants will. The implications of that. So when I was thinking about that, we, 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 we always mentioned that it was an 11-day journey. It was... I think it was um, 8,400 and uh, something kilometers taken just to move between Egypt and Israel. And it took them 40 years. But when you read this, you then understand, you know, that the reason why they were, they were, they were circling around the same area was the, the, the unbelief, their lack of faith in God. And God had said that from that day, that they will not, according to what they had said, they will not enter the promised land. So they had to wander until they die. There was a waiting for them to die before they enter the land because they were not going to enter it. And collectively, our faith builds us up. 
but also collectively our faith is able to delay things in our lives. Amen. 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 Jesus being the, the perfect image of God, we see him healing the sick. We see him feeding the poor. We see him speaking up for the voiceless. I want to say to you today that everything that Christ did is the will of God. If Christ healed, it means that God wants to heal. If Christ provided for the poor, it means that God wants to provide. It is his will for you to be taken care of. Okay. If, God, if Christ healed, if we saw him healing, it is, the, it is the, his will. Therefore, even when we stand in faith, knowing that it is what he wants, it is what he wants because Christ did it. Amen. He healed, he fed, he, he encouraged, he built up the brokenhearted. It's because God wants that to happen. God sent them to go into the promised land, to, to scout it out because he had given it to them. So our perception matters of how we view God. How we pray to God matters. How we follow him matters. You know, uh, they, they say the poverty mentality is one where you think about yourself only. You want to take as much as you can. You don't consider others because you, 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 you think this opportunity is going to pass. But you approach God differently when you know that it is his will for you to be healed. It is his will for you to be provided for. So I can lay down my life. And be comfortable with having a relationship with him, knowing that he will take care of my needs. Yeah, yeah. It is his will. Christ, everything that Christ did is reflecting his will. So you can go back and watch what Christ did on earth. If you see him healing the sick, know that he wants to heal. Yes. Even today. If you see him speaking life to dead situations, know that that's what he wants. So that when I pray to him, I don't pray begging him, thinking that agafuni. I don't pray to him trying to convince him of my situation. The Bible teaches us that even before we ask, he knows our needs. He knows what we need before we ask. What a good God. What a good God. So today, as I want to encourage you as, as, as we, we close the service, that you may remember in, in the journey of preparing ourselves to be disciples, it is his will that overrides any other thing that we need or want. His will is good, perfect, and pleasing. Yeah. Amen. So I pray that where you are, you may relinquish your own strength. You may relinquish whatever thing you have set up to be more important. You may identify the things that stir up intimidation and fear around you and realize that he has not given you a spirit of fear. He has not given you a spirit of fear. And that you can actually leverage on his anointing, leverage on his grace. You can ask him, Lord God, what is your plan for my life? I, I, I want to know you because when I know you, I know what you want for me. And I can trust what you want for me is good. Amen. I can trust that you want me to know your heart maybe more than to acquaint myself with your hand. Mm -hmm. You want me to know what is in your heart for me more than to love what you can give me. Mm -hmm. There are benefits of following Christ. There are, there are benefits of being a disciple. But mostly it's for us to trust God. Trust him to take care of us. Trust him to be there for us. Trust him to meet our needs. But trust him that we are here at this time to serve him. We are here to die to our own needs. Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, he talks about what I had counted as loss. What I had counted as profit rather. I counted as loss to gain Christ. He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. 
He calls himself a Pharisee according to the law. He calls himself the greatest out of the, out of the tribe of Benjamin. He's, he's one of the great, he's also the cream of the crop. But all of these things, all of these things, I regard them as loss. They don't help me in any way. They are lost when I see the value I can have in Christ. When I can see the relationship I can have in Christ. They are all a loss. And that speaks to whatever defenses that you may have. Today it could be your muscle, your financial muscle. Today it could be your connections. It could be your relationships. But even in this time, you will see that everything else will pass away. But it is his word that will remain. It is his love for you that will remain. All of these things, they are passing. All of the people that we think they are our, our boldness, they are what we are sure of, they will not always be there for you. But you can trust God. Amen. So I want to invite anyone who wants to make a decision today to commit their lives to the Lord. If you are here and you say that, I have been wondering, even in my prayers, my prayers are around what I can get out of God. What I want, God, and I see him as if I don't get it, I'm disappointed. And today you want to say to God, I want to know what is your will for me. I want to follow you for what you have said I am, for what you want for my life, over and above what I want. I want to be a follower. I want to be a disciple. I want to lay down my life today. I want to pray with you. As you lift up, you can lift up your hands wherever you are. You can just center your attention to the Lord as we pray. Father God, I thank you for this, your son, for this, your daughter, who's making a decision to be your disciple today, who's making a decision to follow you today. I thank you, Lord God, that they will not give their pearls to pigs, oh God. They will not, Lord God, forsake what is truth, Father God, and think about whatever they have grow, uh, they grew up in, Lord God. They will forget what they've been told, which is not based on truth. They will forget what, what they have always known as a survival mode, as a survival way of doing life. But they will know that, Lord God, indeed you have planned a good life for them. Yes, Lord. You have filled their mouths with good things. Today, Lord God, I pray that they will surrender their lives to you, Lord God. Even at this time, Father God, I pray that you touch them in their homes. Speak, Lord God, and convict them, Lord God, of whatever thing they've said before them, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, for surrender, total surrender to you. As your people are lifting up their worship, their prayers to you, Lord God, we thank you that it's actually your spirit that convicts us of sin. It is your spirit that causes us to see what is in front of us and lay it down, Lord God, for the love you have given them. I pray that you heal those who are sick, oh God. Heal those who are having pain in their bodies, Father God. In the name of Jesus, heal the brokenhearted, Somanda. Heal the brokenhearted, Lord God. We even pray for those, Lord God, who feel a heaviness, Father God, a weight on their shoulder. Your name does not change. You are God who is true, even in 2021. God who is faithful. You are able to heal all diseases, Lord God. Even the diseases without names, you are able to heal all of them. We thank you, Lord God, for a new day upon your children's lives, Lord God. I declare a new day over you right now in the name of Jesus. I declare a new day. I declare the dawning of a new season. Yes, the perspective that you have of God will be good. You will know him as a loving father. You will know him as a redeeming savior. That whatever trouble that you might be in, he is able to save you from it. Whatever thing is overwhelming you, whatever trouble is over, whatever words have been spoken over you, he is able to to save you from it. I'm speaking right now even to the person who is suffering from any kind of mental disruption or mental struggle in, your, in the name of Jesus. I pray for the lifting of that heaviness. 
in the name of Jesus. You will overcome that depression in the name of Jesus. You will overcome even the panic that seems to come over you at night in the name of Jesus. We say be set free right now in the name of Jesus. I speak a sound mind over you right now in the name of Jesus. A sound mind in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is life to us. It sets us free, Lord God. We receive it and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Family, if you are here and you are receiving this word today and you are believing God for a change in your life, I pray that your heart will continue to receive the word of God. You can even continue to watch this sermon. Be, be, be open to searching the scripture for what God says you are. Yeah. Over and above what you have heard about yourself, mm -hmm. over and above your past experiences, over and above what people have said, mm -hmm. you are defined by God first. Mm -hmm. And this is why Christ died. He, Christ, he, he, he died so that there'd be nothing that separates you from the love of God. Amen. So receive that word, embrace that word today. I also wanna say to you that we have a number of people, multiple people in our church who are ready to stand with you in prayer. And if you need someone to, to hold your hand, your virtual hand, you need someone to hold your virtual hand and, and pray with you and stand and believe God with you. Please don't be afraid to reach out to us. Uh, we will stand with you in prayer. We'll believe God with you. We'll share even the word with you. As, as we are receiving, we, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, as we behold... This is beholding God, beholding his, gro his glory. We are being transformed. We are being changed. And we are looking like him. We are becoming like him. So every day we are standing and trusting God. Our lives are changing each and every day. Our lives are, are improving each and every day. Doesn't matter what we are going through, but God is with us. He, was our, he is our sure hope. Today be blessed by the word of God. And, and may you have a great week further. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.